All right, in the 119 years of aviation history, it's littered with aircraft that have done well more than what they were expected to do. Vice versa, there have also been some aircraft that failed to live up to their expectations. Uh, some of them in- include some serious aviation failures from nine-wing monstrosities to a plane with flapping wings. Uh, today, we're going to review this uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just picturing the plane with flapping wings, like some sort of cartoonish car, you know, <laughs> and you see the pilot like bouncing up and down. Like, yeah, this is efficient. This is totally efficient. hundred <laughs> percent. No, no, no unneeded stresses here. <laughs> right. So this is actually from a, an article from the BBC, which is titled world's worst planes, the aircraft that failed. And just from the opening line where it says planes that f- have wings that flap, you can already tell this is going to be a funny one. <laughs> right. Yeah, these are some real lemon laws. Yeah, lemon law aircraft here. Now, for us in the here in the in the present or in their in their future, a lot of aircraft we think are lemons, like they just flat out suck. But for the most part, you know, they follow some simple rules where everyone should kind of understand. You know, like the wings are not meant to flap on purpose; like actually hinge at a point and flap, like. They're supposed to be like semi-rigid to rigid, depending on what kind of airframe it is. It has to have some sort of flow to it. It has to have some kind of aerodynamic design to it. You know, it can't have too much weight in certain areas. Pretty obvious stuff. And for the most part, almost every aircraft today have that. But some of these ones, go ahead, sorry. I was going to say with with the, you know, talking about having rigid wings for flight characteristics and, and, laws of flight and all that how does how do you bank or how do you even do a hard turn in a, a, a plane with flapping wings unless you can make them rigid at some point and then when you're at cruising speed and altitude you the flapping somehow with the natural air currents helps make it more efficient so you can really throttle back and sip on fuel and almost glider style it or because I gotta imagine trying to take off like trying to keep those those wings from just to create lift yes and then get, get up there and you're in a dog fight and you go to turn and they turn on a dime and it takes you it takes you uh three countries to make a turn you know what i mean <laughs> right and not in a good way right it's not like right. it's not like the sr 71 it takes three states to turn because it's going so freaking fast this one is just <laughs> we don't want the wings to tear off <laughs> because <laughs> it's flapping <laughs> but but going on what, what we were saying like that's an actual plane that really did exist. And that plane is called the Christmas bullet. <laughs> uh, it was designed by Dr. William Whitney Christmas, who was described by one of aviation's uh, famous historians, one of the greatest charlatans to ever see his name associated with an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what this aircraft was is instead of having struts, the, air, the aircraft's wings were supposed to flap like like we were just saying like it's like on a hinge or something it's just supposed to flap its way up and down as it's uh the, the runway and up as it's flying the problem with something like that was since there's nothing supporting the wings both times they flew this thing and both times it crashed because the the wings separated from the aircraft <laughs> surprise surprise weird right <laughs> right they would and twist off. Yeah, it says here they would twist off the airframe at the first opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> the wings, the wings essentially try to take off and the wings clap each other right underneath, <laughs> underneath the gear. Smack. <laughs> what, a, what a garbage design. Right. And that's exactly like, uh, you, this is regarded, the Christmas bullet is regarded as the worst aircraft design in U.S. history or in history by the U.S. government. Like that, that says a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what about some of those? Remember seeing that old footage from like those old Da Vinci? Uh, somebody found like the drawings of Da Vinci's first flying, flying machines, I guess is what you would call it. Yep. They had ones that had like, again, you know, a lot of wings to it. Ones that was like a guy sitting on a bicycle and, and pedaling as fast as he could trying to turn a propeller. Mm-hmm. And then there was another one, look like a hi hat symbol that would like, it would just up and down smack each other and just beat the shit out of the pilot into the ground but it never really took off you know what i mean it just kind of skipped across the ground <laughs> like it's 
how did you expect this thing to fly? I mean, I guess at one point it would fly, but that, I don't think the wheels leaving the ground is considered flying. I, I um, think you <laughs> imagine that after the flight test. Hey, how do you feel? Well, my spine's through my asshole, so I'm uh, I'm doing pretty good, I guess. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, just doing vibration checks, right, for like a brand new plane, whatever the airframe is. Sometimes you get like these these vertical beats or these uh, lateral beats, and you can just see the pilot just like getting beat up in there, like using a washing machine, just like you know. And then you ask him once it's all over. I mean, for compared to the hi hat plane vibrations like next to none but then you ask the pilot hey what happened like oh i feel like someone just beat up my freaking kidneys and stuff you know so that's with a plane that's kind of sort of <clears throat> built like what it's supposed to versus like something like a hi-hat plane <laughs> where you're just bouncing up and down like just <laughs> i i'll never forget that man i saw that thing and i was like what in god somebody looked at that and said this is gonna work i have a feeling this is good. this is it this is the future you know what i mean <laughs> Right. <laughs> and uh, I, I mean, obviously, nobody's using strain gauges and uh, and and doing structural vibe testing uh, on any of these. And they're all made of uh, wood back in those times, wood and fabric. But I got to believe I got to believe that didn't last very long. Right. Uh, another, uh, another basic principle is when a plane you're, when you build a plane, you got to build it for what it's meant to do. <clears throat> Another example in this article was um, a plane built by Britain's now defunct aircraft maker Blackburn. They tried to take a a bomber plane or a bomber support plane and kind of turn it into a gunship. So they took all the guns from the front and then and then stuck it to the side. So like they. They basically like just offset its its a uh, weight and balance weight and or weight balance. and CG. So, with all the guns on 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 the side instead of on the front, like it was designed to, <clears throat> the plane could only fly in a straight line. So, if it did any sort of turns, then it will then they'll offset its its CG so much that it will start to go into oblivion. <laughs> Yeah, it said, so Blackburn decided to stick four machine gun turrets behind the pilot, the kind usually seen on the multi-engine bombers, and take out any front-firing guns. The weight of the turret meant that ROC, which is what they named the plan ROC, was far too slow. Uh, let's see. What's more, that the guns wouldn't fire properly unless the aircraft was flying in a straight line. So good luck in the dogfight. Uh, yeah, it says the Royal Navy refused to allow the rock to fly off its carriers <laughs> and the aircraft could only manage to shoot down one aircraft, a German Junker uh, bomber in the entire war. Well, I guess <laughs> at least it's got one kill to its name. <laughs> and you know, whoever designed that went, see, see, like it was a complete flop until that one lucky day. Right. <laughs> and, and he went, see, see, proven design. <laughs> yeah. So they, they, that that plane was pressed into service into three different roles, and it failed every single one of them. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we got one kill on our on our freaking column. What about you? <laughs> Can you imagine all the all the air crew like, hey, what am I assigned to fly the rock? Yeah. Well, speaking of rock, let's rock paper scissors to see who has to fly this thing today. You know, what right? I mean? <laughs> right. Like ah, <laughs> uh, de- or you know, like draw straws. Like ah, oh, damn it, I always get the short straw. <laughs> Yeah, it says Blackburn's Botha, Botha, B O T H A is what it says. Uh, two engine torpedo bomber and reconnaissance aircraft, which first flew in 1938. Uh, the first problem the view from the crew uh, compartment was so appalling that the aircraft was deemed useless as a recon plane. Next, it turned it uh, out, it was dangerously underpowered. The extra weight from, the, from suddenly having to carry an extra crew member meant the plane uh, would have struggled to carry its intended torpedo armament. When they were phased out of the frontline service in 41, they passed on to training squadrons, but the Botha was so tr- uh, tricky to fly that there were many accidents. Botha ended up being a failure and never fulfilling its roles it was designed for. So back to what Six was saying, you got to build it to what its intended purpose is. Right. Which, you know, like, I get what they're trying to do. You know, they're trying to give it a, a semi-multi-role or not just have it so niche that like this is the only thing it can do <clears throat> which almost anyone that designs a plane they kind of want that to happen you don't want it to be so niche down that once that niche goes away then the whole plane scrap 
But as proven by this, like when you you put too much enthusiasm into an airframe, like you're just really falling in love with this airframe and you try to make it do them more, more than what it's supposed to, you run into some problems and ultimately just scrapping the whole thing anyway. Huh, that sounds like me. Try to make me do more than I'm I'm supposed to, and then I just collapse upon myself. <laughs> same, <laughs> same here. <laughs> Tear. <laughs> I'm, I'm attacked right now. <laughs> Hard truths. Hard, sad, but true. <laughs> <laughs> Was it sad? No, sad patrol. <laughs> sad sad patrol. patrol, yeah. <laughs> sad patrol. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, man. Uh, going on a tangent. When I first heard that song, it, that's the first thing that popped in my mind. And then when you said it that one day, like, oh, my God, I'm not the only one. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't the only one. And then uh, a buddy of mine, when I was in A&P school, um, he, I, I was in, like, we were, I think I was, we were driving somewhere and that song came on and I said, Sad Patrol. And he almost wrecked the truck as he looked over at me and went, what did you just say? I said, isn't that what you're saying? Sad Patrol? And he's like, no, sad, but true. Ah, well. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say I was young when uh, that happened, but I was uh, I was almost 20 years old, I think. So I guess young, but uh, not as young as you would think. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. You're like, Skirk! what did you just say? What don't you, you don't you ever talk? <laughs> dare you slander Metallica's lyrics like that? <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, another thing about aircraft design is like, don't think too far outside of the box, right? Most times when people see planes, they're like, wow, that looks really cool. Or they see like these high flying fighter jets, like, wow, that's really cool. And a lot of it takes some creativity, right? Like how, well, to build an airplane in the, in the first place, that must have been a, a curveball out of nowhere to just, you know what? Let's put people in the air, right? But certain designs, they're a little more over the top than they should be. An example of this was in World War I. Um, this one aircraft factory, BE-9, or Royal Aircraft Factory, BE-9, tried to go a step further in aircraft design. And they designed this plane where they put the propeller not in the front, but in the middle of the aircraft. So... Normally, in most other propeller-style aircraft, you have the propeller, then you have the pilot and the co-pilot, or in warplanes, the the gunner. For for this one, it goes pilot, propeller, co-pilot. <laughs> no, it goes gunner, gunner. Well, I guess it could be the co-pilot too. I don't know if there was a control yoke up in that front part, but it, they put the gunner up there, then the propeller, and then the pilot. But oh, right. Right. I, I get what they I get I get what they were doing right because you had to work on timing from some of those old propeller uh, aircraft to where you would time the bullets to shoot between how the when the propeller was rotating between the blades right but probably at that time they didn't have we didn't have the technology they didn't have the technology whoever to do that timing I think that came around World War II um, or maybe towards the end of World War One I, I I can't remember. But anyways, I know what they were trying to do, right? Unobstructed view, and you can shoot freely. Uh, but you imagine flying along, like, on your way to a mission, like, hey, man, can you pass me the water? <laughs> <laughs> and the pilot's, like, trying to throw it between the blades, like, oh, my God. <laughs> right. And, and, and exactly so. It was deemed extremely dangerous because you have a propeller separating two of the air crew. So, like... Say like a very strong draft comes and it makes the propeller blades uh, flex in a certain way, which they do. That's potentially of slicing the, one of the air crew members. Or if they crash or I'll say a hard landing or crash, the engine would like crush the, the guy in the back seat. Yeah, it would crush the guy. Or if you hard landed, you'd snap the, the gunner, gunner seat right off. Yes. And you end up running over them and hitting them with the propeller and the rest of the rest of the aircraft this thing's wild looking man i'm looking at this picture in this article yep that's that's wild yeah i mean again we get the idea right we want to have an unimpeded view of the gunner because we don't want to have to go to the trouble of having to time the bullets through the propeller blades makes sense but if we're going to go to that much trouble you might as well just make it a rear facing gun like in most other biplanes at the time and just shoot backwards like just try to 
do like naval style warfare where you kind of got to get up to the side and just have the gunners shoot to the side or behind them, you know, not. Well, I think in some part of World War I, they flew with uh, revolvers and hand grenades and they would literally just drop hand grenades out of their planes or they would try to shoot at the other guys with, with a revolver pistol as they're flying around. Isn't that yeah. crazy? That is crazy. This kind of, that kind of reminds me of the old dirigible days, you know what I'm talking about? Like the, the, old, yeah. the, uh, the war blimps, balloons. The zeppelins. Yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> you know, it's just like a, a a blimp, and then you just have like a bunch of bombs and a potato sack, and just drop it on your enemy. <laughs> Fun fact: going back to talking about music, and on a, another side tangent, uh, that's how uh, Led Zeppelin got their name. Is they when they first were putting their music out there, uh, a few uh, people in the industry said, "Your music's no good. Your career is going to take off like a Led Zeppelin." And um, that's how they got it. Wow. I like, did oh, not. Right, know sounds that. good. Let me, let me show you. Let me show you. Right. Not all are going to top the charts, for you, make you feel real stupid for not uh, believing in this. <laughs> I feel like uh, that's, I want that. I want, I want that too. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. I think all of everybody does, you know, just be able to just show the day series. Like, Oh, like I wasn't bullshitted, you know? So, uh, moving on to the next part of this article. In the 1920s, Italian plane maker Caproni designed the CA-60 Novaplano, Novaplano to fly 100 passengers across the Atlantic. Oh, wow. It must rank as one of the ugliest things to ever take to the air. <laughs> God, <laughs> I can't wait to see what this thing looks like. It has no less than nine wings, three sets of three, and eight engines. The cumbersome beast flew only once from Italy's Lake Maggiore and reached the dizzy height of 60 feet before crashing back down into the water. The pilot escaped unhurt through the wrecked aircraft. It was destroyed in a fire after being dragged ashore. Nine wing planes have been conspicuously absent from aviation record books ever since. <laughs> <laughs> it flew a, a dizzying 60 feet. Oh my God. Before <laughs> crashing right into the lake. Oh my god. Oh my god, man. The, this freaking plane. It looks like a, a like a steam like a like a steam yacht. You know what I mean? Or a steamboat steam yacht. Jesus man. Get your history together, man. Um it looks like one of those like old like Mississippi River boats. Oh paddle wheel boats, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, like it doesn't look like a plane. It looks like a house. Like you're looking like at a side view of a house. You, I mean, you know what? That might have been there, might have been why though, because obviously we've been in boats for far longer than we've been in uh aircraft and, and that's why a lot of our terms that we use in aviation are also from the nautical sense, because that's that's kind of what we came from. So it makes sense kind of why they would say, Well, let's if the boat can go that way, I'm sure this is just a boat in the air, right? Let's. Yeah. Let's yeah. Work. I Absolutely. mean, the Avengers made it with that carrier. Why can't, <laughs> why can't the Italians in this uh, Caproni? Right. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, going back to the, to the whole helicarrier thing. When I first saw that movie and when the whole scene where they said like, Oh, the Hulk is on the, on the aircraft carrier. I, I no kidding. Thought it was going to turn into a submarine and not into a freaking yeah. a jet plane. <laughs> yep. I thought so too. I was like, oh, it's going to dive. Right. And then, nope, we're going to lift off. Like, ooh, here we go. <laughs> a plane that launches smaller planes in the air. <laughs> it's like, wow, what a, what a novel concept. I mean, if, if that was, was actually possible, that'd be a freaking amazing because you can go anywhere. You can deploy anything anywhere and you're not impeded by sea. You're not. De- it, you're not impeded by whatever kind of uh, what kind of craziness the the ocean could toss at you, you know. Yeah, think about that. Like if if you know uh, a hurricane's coming, you got rough seas. You could just all right. Well, we're gonna get out of the sea and fly around the storm, right? Or just go above altitude where the storm can't touch you. Yep. You just have to have everyone wear oxygen mask and like magnetic boots so they don't fly off. <laughs> and shit. Well, I think that's what at least they showed that in one part of that movie, right? Is they, they when they rang the alarm, every all the flight deck members ran in, grabbed their their O2 tanks and masks. Very true. Yes, you're right. They did. <clears throat> interesting. Very interesting. Uh, and moving on with this article, be better than your predecessor. 
The Ferry Albacore was a carrier-based torpedo bomber designed to replace the venerable Ferry Swordfish, a canvas-covered biplane with open cockpits that served on the front line at the beginning of World War II. This two-wing Albacore had a modern, more battle-friendly and closed cockpit and was more aerodynamically streamlined, and it began replacing Swordfish until 1940. But crews didn't take to it because the Albacore wasn't pleasant to fly, and pilots insisted on flying the swordfish instead. The albacores were retired in 1943, and the last swordfish didn't come off until a year after. Oh, wow. I was like, oh, well, you know, I think that's more uh, user, user uh, preference, you know? Like, it's not worse. It just wasn't fun, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I can uh, make it happen. Yeah, it's kind of like driving a, uh, driving a smart car to a Lamborghini. Right. I mean, I can still can get from point A to point B. It's just what 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 experience do I want? Or a smart car to a Bentley, right? Right. You know, yeah, one's just obviously way more nicer to ride around in. <laughs> yep. Uh, well, I can kind of sort of relate or I can see a relation to this when they phased out the CH-46 uh, from the, the Marines uh, aviation uh, complement. Like everyone was all about that plane. Like they loved it. It looked like shit, but everyone loved it. Like this is a, a freaking workhorse of the aviation world. When they replaced that with the Osprey, oh, everyone was hating it. Right? This thing looks mm-hmm. stupid. This thing has a bigger landing zone. It's scary to ride in. Uh, and of course, you know, it had its shared mishaps, and everyone was like, "Oh, this plane's a piece of shit." Right? But then you look at it today, and it's like just it performing just as good, if not slightly better than its predecessor. But people still talk shit about this plane, like. No, it's nowhere near as good as the CH-46. Like, I mean, he said, she said, but I think at that point, it's just people preference, you know? Like, Yeah, I think school. it's what you cut your teeth on, right? Right. Because I talked to a bunch of air crew members who grew up with the, Os- with the Osprey, and they're like ranting and raving pretty good things about it. Like, oh, this plane is badass, you know? I mean, I'm sure it has its share of maintenance challenges, and we won't go into depth about that, but... Most people, when they talk about Jasper, they freaking love it. Like, oh, this is better than this. This is better than uh, this kind of helicopter and this and that. And like, mm, see, I guess it's just, just got to get with the times, you know, or like MVP said, you know, it's what you cut your teeth with. Yeah. You got that nostalgia aspect for it. Cause that's what you learned on. So, so you'll defend it just for that aspect. Cause you, cause you spent time with it. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. you know, if you never spent any time with it, like, what do you give a damn? Whatever boomer. Nobody gives a shit Whatever. about your plane. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> like, what kind of pterodactyls did you ride when you were, you were young? Shut up, man. <laughs> uh, let's, let's see. Uh, necessity isn't always the mother of invention. <laughs> <laughs> we think we kind of touched that a little bit with the Osprey. <laughs> uh, two aircraft from the final days of the Third Reich uh, show desperate times shouldn't always call for desperate measures. <laughs> um <laughs> Holy heck, the, the German word. Uh, Messerschmitt. Messerschmitt. Wow, thanks, man. <laughs> the ME-163 uh, Comet was a rocket-powered interceptor developed to shoot down the heavy bombers raiding Germany. The Comet could fly 100 miles per hour faster than the Allied fighter plane, but had only three minutes worth of fuel. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> the Look at that tiny little propeller on the front of that thing. Right. <laughs> It looks like one you would see on top of those hats. You know what I'm saying? Like those yeah. little multicolored hats of the propeller. That's, that's what that fucking thing looks like. <laughs> did somebody just put that on? Like, did you think one of the German engineers put that on? And as for this, I will add the tiny propeller <laughs> for fun. You know, like, what is that doing at that point? Right. It's, it's just meant to like, just, I really don't know. Like, uh, but it had three minutes worth of fuel. The aircraft had to glide back down to base under its own power. One problem was the fuel, an oxidizing agent called T Soft, helped power the plane, but it was also so volatile it would combust on contact with clothing or leather. Jesus. Oh, that's great because we all know World War II, the aircrew definitely never wore leather. Right. <laughs> Jesus, man. I mean, what's it? Not even 100 low leads that volatile, I don't think. Yeah, that T stuff. T T dash S T O F F. I've never heard of that before. I'll have to I'll have to look into that. Right. I mean, 
I know, 100 low lead is pretty volatile itself. You sneeze in its general direction, it'll get offended and explode, you know? Yeah. But this stuff, tea stuff, wow. This one sounds like just by existing, it'll, uh, <laughs> it'll, it'll go off. Right? <laughs> like, I am, I am fuel and I hate you and it just explodes. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> I can go super fast for three minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> that that's not feasible, man. Like, picture that. It that's takes essentially a, a Germany's version of the kamikaze. You know where you're going if you're flying that thing. Yeah, no kidding, right? I mean, it takes three minutes for an aircraft to leave the ground, much less do something worthwhile and then come back down on its own power. You know, was this one of the ones they they would launch from? another like a bomber or something like that like you would drop it off and it would go Ooh, that's a good or, question i'm, I'm not or, a i don't know if they did that kind of stuff back in world war ii i gotta do more research Should yeah i don't i don't you, but i mean it sounds smart like that's what if we only got three minutes we might as well put it in the air to begin with but yeah i don't foresee it like taking off on on its own power doing something worthwhile for let's go on the generous side two minutes and then land back safe and sound in, in the next 30 seconds. Yeah, I mean, that means you got to hit your target. You got to essentially be over top of the airfield you took off from. Hit yeah. your target and land again. And beat, and beat the plane you just shot down to the ground. Yeah, not, not, wow. I don't foresee that being remotely feasible. Uh, the second one was the Heinkel uh, HE-162. It was another last-ditch design by the Nazi regime. The aerodynamically advanced HE-162 went from first drawings to production in 90 days. Wow. The Germans drew up plans to build 3,000 of them in a month. The wooden HE-162 was designed to be flown by a teenage pilot with only rudimentary training. Oh, but the, God. Oh, that just sounds terrible already. The HE-162, through an excellent design, needed careful handling. Things weren't helped by the location of the engine right above the cockpit. <laughs> what? Meaning escaping pilots ran the risk of being sucked into the engine. Jesus. <laughs> Just. Meaning escaping pilots ran the risk of being sucked into the engine. Oh, some major design fault was the glue that used to stick the plane together actually corroded the airframe. Oh, well. <laughs> I guess they yeah. weren't using Elmers back then. Right. That that's pretty pretty bad. Like a major design flaw was the glue corroding the aircraft that kept the whole thing together. Just that sounded like a a, a flop all on its own. Yeah, just no, all sorts of no. And then you know they did first of all like you designed the thing from from blueprint to manufacturing in ninety days. That's already a big no. And then. You're putting brand new, never before, never sat in a flight seat in their life pilot. And then we're going to make it so dangerous that if this pilot does end up having to crash, he now runs the risk of getting sucked into the engine or the aircraft just falling apart in midair because of the glue corroding the airframe. Or both. (laughs) Or both. (laughs) I can. I I think at that point, you just hope you do get sucked into the engine. Just just end it right there. Right. Instead of riding that pain train all the way into the ground. <laughs> Again, you know, like it's one of those like you know where you're going when you're flying this thing. You know, like it's one one way trip kind of thing. Imagine them going into the German schools back then. Who here knows what an airplane is? Who I do. Ah. Come with me. <laughs> I have a <laughs> no. job for you. Or you know or you know it's like who wants to fly airplanes and they just like drag it. No. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're going to serve your pilot. You're going to serve your country. Fly planes. No. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I'd assume that's how they did it because you know what these kind of designs like. It's not going to be good. It's it's a one way trip, and that's there's no way to cut that any other way. Ah, boy. These these are like terrible. Like these are not just lemons. These are just like death traps. Is what they are. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we I, we've complained uh, numerous times about certain planes having some issues, but most of that is due to age. You know, like it's been around too long. We need to update the airframe or we need to replace some stuff that's no longer made. But some of these, man, are just like, did these should have never been made. <laughs> yeah, these are crap out the gate. But like, like you said, right? It's the it was a a, a dying a dying regime's 
last last ditch efforts to uh to win but mm-hmm. obviously uh good thing they didn't and glad these things never made it to uh full scale production cuz that's pretty bad right no kidding what kind of glue are they using that would corrode right the airframe i'm curious on that too cuz i mean even if the i'm not sure if they used composite back then or anything that resembles composites back well, then. It, but didn't it say it was a wood? Uh, your plans built three thousand a month. Yeah, it was wooden. Yeah, it was wooden. Yeah. So what so kind like, of glue are they using that? That's eating the wood up. Like freaking carpenter and acid or something, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, why? They they make, mix lye and beeswax or some shit, and right? <laughs> <laughs> It's like, wow. no, uh, off tangent, man. Speaking about designs, man, that, that just came out of nothing. So this was a, a story a friend told me. And I, and I want to say this is true because he mentions that there's an actual uh, spot of this story in the Boeing Museum in Washington. So three very high ranking individuals. One was the owner of Boeing. One was a representative for the military. And I, I forget what the third one was, but they're all sitting at a cocktail bar and they're saying, and the military guy goes, I need a bomber. I need a fueler. And I need that now. So, so here comes Boeing. He's like, okay, so here's my 707 that we just made. He gets a Well, he gets like a, a cocktail napkin and he draws his 707 and he says, here's my 707. I'm good. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to stretch this out and then split it in half at the tail. And there's your bomber. And that became the B-52 bomber. And then same 707 airframe. And they say, and he goes, we're going to take out all the cargo stuff and stick a fuel bladder in there. And then there's your KC-135 fueler for the bomber. And I didn't believe him when he said it. Like, really? That's what happened? How those two planes were made? And he goes like, yeah, there's a the cocktail napkin where he drew all that on. It's on the museum in in uh, Washington. I'm like, shut the hell up. Really? <laughs> they really? That's how they came up with that plane? <laughs> you know, I never, I never knew that either. Yeah. I mean, it sounded too good to be true when he's like, okay, dude, that's a really good story, man. Is this one of those, like, one of those creation myth kind of things? And he said, and then he goes, no, this is really a thing. Like, the napkin where they came up with the whole design is in a museum in in uh, Washington. Like, well, what do you hell wow. do you know? Imagine, I mean, you'll never be able to pull that kind of shit today. But <laughs> imagine, I don't know, man. Some of the stuff that I still see out there, I'm, I'm like, boy, somebody was drinking heavy the night before when they came <laughs> up with this thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, why they would design things? Like, I know we've talked about poor designs and engineer hates engineering hates you know, maintainers. That's why they design things a certain way. But you still see some stuff and you're like, why, why would we do that? That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. No shit. <laughs> uh, but you know, not all design, not all flawed designs. Like they find themselves in the scrap heap. Uh, an example is the Douglas DC 10 medium and long hauler airliner ended its flying days with a good safety record, but only after a series of serious Issues were discovered back in the 70s. So, I mean, mm. it's one of those like learning curve, right? Like we realized we, we were a little too hasty with the design. We may, be, may have been a little too enthusiastic. And sadly, some of them don't get discovered until mishaps happen. But it's what you do when, when you find them, right? Like, how do we prevent it? Is it cost effective to, to uh, fix it, right? Or to um, re- reinvent some of the things? instead of just scrapping the whole airframe altogether, right? Mm-hmm. And in the case of the DC-10, it actually did make its way through and ended its service. Nice. <laughs> but listen to what this, the major flaw was during those 1970s discoveries. Uh, <clears throat> the plane's cargo door. Instead of opening inwards, it opened out. And Douglas's designers figuring this left more room to load cargo the doors needed to be closed with heavy bolts and then locked with pins on the outside of the aircraft. But the pins would be locked without having bolts, without the bolts having been properly fastened, meaning there was no way to be uh, sure the cargo doors were locked. 
At least two aircraft were destroyed in such crashes, including a Turkish Airways DC-10, which crashed in France. That took the lives of 350 people. Uh, and then the DC-10 was briefly grounded by U.S. aviation chiefs. And while the flaw was fixed, the DC-10 struggled to rid itself of the bad reputation. Wow. Yeah. I Man, it'd be good, good, good intention, right, on the engineers, but poor execution. Yes. And, and that happens, right? Because you're not going to, like we were saying in a previous episode, you're not going to be able to predict everything, right? And some of the predictions comes with the manufacturing of stuff, right? Like, how many variances are you allowed to have on a certain part before you know it's bad, right? And most cases, a lot of pla- places that make parts or any type of manufacturing with tight tolerances, it's because of that reason, right? They figured it out through some kind of stress test or even worse from a customer using this and finding out that it breaks to actually go back and like, okay, we need to re- in- or reestablish our threshold. We need to figure out what tolerances really do affect the plane or the manufactured item. And then adjust from there. But in this case, it said it was the cargo door. So, I mean, at least it's not something like, I don't know, the propeller being behind the freaking co-pilot. <laughs> well, yeah. And speaking of propellers, um, I, I, it was a French plane. I think it was like World War I era. Um, and I can't remember what it was, what the, what the manufacturer was. But I, I remember learnt, reading about this and it had a... It took the. It was a radial engine, and it took the crankshaft, and they hard mounted the crankshaft to the firewall to the airframe. And so, instead of the crank and pistons and rods all turning internal to the motor, the actual motor rotated around the crankshaft. What? <laughs> and so, like the propeller was fixed, so the the engine was spinning just as fast as the propeller, and and it would cause so much vibrations that the the. Uh, crankshaft would shear from the firewall to be flying along and just watch your motor just cartwheel off into nowhere oh my god (laughs) what do i do now you know (laughs) just hopefully you can glide that sob all the way down but yeah i'll never forget that i'll have to look that up again and see what that manufacturer was but that was that was one thing i remember reading uh in early days i think when i was in school um and i was like who who in god's name thought that was a good idea yeah i mean like i mean i for everyone out there, man, like a crankshaft is nowhere near as heavy as an engine. And I'm I'm just curious, like how that actually works, right? Because how do you have the engine spinning on the, on the, on the shaft, you know? Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I picture it in my head, but I don't think it's as simple as I'm picturing it. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, I like, guess how, it's, how do you, how do you, where did you, how did you feed fuel into the motor? Right. That, that's exactly what I was going with, right? Like, how does the fuel go in? How does it stay in? How does it keep going in a sense, right? Yeah, uh, I, d- I'm going to have to do some more research on that because uh, I, can't, I, I can't remember. But I remember reading about that. That blew my mind. Yeah, like that, that just sounds extremely flawed, <laughs> and to say the least, you know? And uh, gr- granted, it's actually, I think it's just as bad as having the propeller between two pilots. Or between two air crew members, because it's one thing to be sliced by the propeller. It's another thing for the engine to do whatever it wants and just hop off the plane when it feels like it. <laughs> Can you imagine though, like you're like you're all excited, it's it's you know, new into the into a new century, all this technology. We're flying now, and somebody goes, You know, I want to be a pilot. Excellent. We're gonna sign you up, we'll get you some training. What am I gonna be flying? They oh great, good, I'm glad you asked. Let's walk out to the hangar and you walk out there. And you're looking at it and you're going, I uh, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Can I fly that one over there? No, no, no. That's for the that's for the experienced pilots. I feel like the experienced ones should be flying this thing. This this one seems dangerous. No, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Put on yeah. your leather skull cap, your goggles, your leather jacket, and get the hell in the air. Right. Oh, oh, by the way, don't let the fuel touch you, uh, touch your clothes, touch your skin, nothing, because it will burn. And then right as you start up and they're, and they're getting ready to uh, turn the propeller over for you. Oh, and by the way, the glue disintegrates the airframe. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get sucked in by the engine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I mean, that just sounds terrible. I mean, yeah. 
But can you imagine like some other designs that are actually cool, right? Like being the first pilot for the F-14 or the SR-71 even. Mm-hmm. There, some of the pilots, like they've done like some speeches and they talked about their first experience in the SR-71. And they're just describing like this plane, like how it's how it looked, how it was made. And just like being how much being on the ground for that thing actually sucked. Like, like uh, they engineered the SR-71 to have gaps. Uh, in parts of the fuselage and so when it's on the ground and it's started up it's like leaking fuel everywhere but yeah. as, soon, as soon as it gets up to altitude it gets to its cruising speed all those gaps expand because of how hot it gets mm-hmm. I think they said like that aircraft uh, expands like a solid four inches because of all the heat that it goes through like can you imagine like designing something with known leaks yeah be knowing that the speed stresses all the dynamics it's going to go through will then close those gaps and close the tolerances. Uh, yeah. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty wild. Yeah. And then and just imagine, imagine like telling the pilot that like this thing is, le- is going to leak. That's, we know that. But as soon as you get up to your cruising outs too, which is like Mach two and a half, it'll close up. It'll be fine. Like, wait, what? To Mach 2 what? <laughs> yeah. Mach 2 who? Yeah, right. And they, I think they said that aircraft goes into an excess of three of Mach 3. Easy, right? We don't yeah. actually know the, the full speed because it's still, un, uh, still classified. But imagine that going three times the speed of sound. I, th- I think one of the pilots mentioned that they went from, they, they went, they flown across the state of Nebraska in under four minutes. I remember talking to one of the pilots and they took off out of Southern California, went across the Southern United States, up the East coast, across the Northern. And then when they turned over Washington and headed back South, they, they went, I mean, full throttle and they missed their, their throttle, uh, retardation point by, I can't remember how many seconds, and carrying that kind of speed, they ended up halfway over Mexico and had to turn and come back north. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just yeah. just because that's how fast they were they were screaming. Like, yeah, that's that's wild. Uh, I think another one mentioned uh, they went from Los Angeles Airport to and they flew from there to DC in under an hour and some change. Oh Holy yeah, shit, <laughs> hauling ass. I remember uh, listening to some some of the flight test pilots and engineers for um, one of these, um, one of the space companies out there. And they talked about testing, testing their one craft and they, they had to redesign like the tails on it and like redo the angles on them. So when the thing folded in half, it, they got into an uncontrolled flat spin Right as they're re-entering uh, the atmosphere, yep. And there's uh, and they talk about like it was um, it was scary, but but they they kept their cool because of all the training. Right, they had gone through so much training and, and planning for every possible contingency. Um, they they were able to you know regain control and land safely and, and no harm, no foul. But out of that test, right, they learned that. Um, Okay, we got to change some angles here because otherwise it's just gonna it's just gonna spiral us the whole time instead of letting us float right back in. Right, it's it's amazing, man. Like just how like the little things like angles or what the materials made of can make such a huge difference. Mm-hmm. You know, and and we're we're lucky to be in the time and age now where we can simulate some of this stuff before we stick a real person into it. <laughs> and. Like examples were these lemons we just mentioned, like some of them, like it's trial and error. Like we have to have it built full scale before we find out that there's something wrong with it. And I'd imagine that learning curve on that was like a 90 degree turn. It's just bad times. And you, you, we've, you, we've mentioned that so many times on the episode already. Like some of them, they only mentioned, they only built two of them and they crashed both of them or it only got up to 60 feet before it freaking obliterated itself into a ball of fire. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's wild when you think about some of the designs. I mean, and you know, you don't know until you try, I guess, type thing. But again, we're fortunate in today's um, 
today's world, we have so many testing cells and, and software programs, and we can test every aspect of the aircraft prior to prior to building a production model, right? You can do small scale production and you can test the wings ahead of time. You can test the engine efficiencies and performance ahead of time. You can test and you take all those numbers and factors and then, okay, the airframe's got to be able to withstand this kind of, uh, you know, forces imposed upon it. And, but how do we do that with, you know, the, lightest material possible and so there's all sorts of individualized uh structural testing that goes on a lot of which we didn't have the knowledge or the ability to back in the times of some of these aircraft we've covered um i mean even world war ii right we that was i think what surged uh world war one to world war ii and such uh surged aviation as far as it did from the right flyer in 1903 i mean if you look at it and just just under 50 years, we went from the right flyer to, uh, to aircraft that could almost break the speed of sound, you know? Yes. And I want to say like two in the fifties, that's when they started coming out with helicopters. I mean, helicopters are general. Imagine the, the mind that thought of that. Like I'm going to have the wing spin instead of the engine. Right. Like, mm-hmm. like say what now? <laughs> right. And, and, for all I know, right, the person who invented the first ever helicopter, he just said, like, I saw a hummingbird today, and it just hovered there, just chilling, doing its thing. And somehow that, that equated to him designing a helicopter, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sort of defies physics a little bit, I think. Yeah. Or, like, it's uh, it, the, the level of aerodynamics that a helicopter requires is just significantly more than just the standard-issued aircraft, right? Because mm-hmm. for the most part, an aircraft is just... The speed is what's keeping it in the air versus like a helicopter, you know, like this, it's still speed, but now it's the wings doing the spinning instead of the engine, right? Or the wind passing over the wing. So uh, by all means, man, like someone who's a flight science degree, please don't like talk shit about us because <laughs> we're trying to like just wave top a lot of this stuff. But it, feel free to tell us like some of the sciences that go into like what well, making a certain plane fly and why certain airframes are designed the way they are. Please do. And we're all about that. Yeah, well, definitely. Great. Yeah, I, I I could use some more education on it for sure. Yes, <laughs> we we all can. You know, it's all about getting better and improving yourself. Can't say we know everything. Sometimes we just we know that it works, and we don't question why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, like I don't know how this engine works, but whatever it works, all I know is don't stick your hand here. <laughs> yeah, this is the the finger loosey area. <laughs> right, like, beware of backblast. Got it. <laughs> yeah understood understood do not go there like you don't you don't even question it and then nowadays with avionics it's like don't be within 100 feet of irradiating uh um antennas or something like that yeah my Got favorite it. thing is they tell you that after you've been sitting in the shade of the wing for four or five hours right, right. doing ground testing and yep. then they come out and go what are you doing so have you been here the whole time yeah Oh man, you got to give a 300 foot radius to this. Great. That would have been nice to talk about in the pre-test brief that we went through, but, um, but good to know. Right. Hopefully I can have kids. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If any of you guys have any myths about like what certain things, uh, will impede you on, like standing close to antennas will make you lose your, your kid count or something like that. <laughs> uh, please let, tell us, let us know. Yeah, and if uh, I know we just covered this article, but if you guys know of any other aircraft that are out there that we missed or that you've had experience with and why they were, you know, lemons and had to be changed or scrapped, um, or if you're in one of those areas that you're kind of uh, developing stuff and, and you're cleared to be able to talk about it, uh, please let us know. We'd love to have you on and discuss some of those things. Mm-hmm. Again, I know most of that new age development stuff's probably all classified or whatever else but if you work for a uh private corporation and they're willing to let you uh discuss new designs and why why it's designed a certain way um man that'd be fantastic please do uh final words mvp be wary if somebody asks you to jump into a cockpit very quick uh (laughs) on a new design just 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 ask some questions first 
Yes. <laughs> Very much asked questions, right? And sometimes uh, new does not meet equal good, but at the same time, like, uh, don't shy away from new because you're attached to a certain airframe. <laughs> that that yeah, be don't don't hinder your uh, ability to, to learn something new. Yes, very much so. Well, on that note, thanks everybody for listening, and we'll see you again next time. Bye, everyone. We'd like to take this time to thank our patrons for supporting our show and allowing us to continue to make episodes, maintain our gear, and create merch for all of our listeners. With special thanks to Erica Lamont, Chris Hawkins, Ryan Freshour, Dan Schubert. Jenny Dignan, and the ladies of the Dick Talk and Mimosas podcast. Thank you all so much for your support and patronage. Visit our shop at cancelformaintenance.com and grab some swag to show off both your support for us and your prowess as an aircraft technician. If you have ideas for the show or you'd like to be a guest on the show, visit our contact us section and send us a line. We will do what we can to get your ideas or yourself on the show. You can also follow us on social media such as on Facebook, at Cancel for Maintenance, Instagram at Kanks, that's C A N X for Maintenance Podcast, or on Twitter at CXMX Podcast. Check out some of our affiliates like Rockwell Time, where they make both rugged and classy watches to fit your lifestyle. Use the code CX4MX and save 10% off your purchase. Support us on Patreon. Our patrons get exclusive perks such as access to our Discord discounts and early access to merch, special patron-only episodes, and so much more. Thank you again so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.